the Bamboo Lab XP and A series 3D printers are now officially previous generation. So is it worth upgrading them with third party parts? Today we test three modifications from Big3 Tech to find out. Love them or hate them, Bamboo Lab have built their empire on a philosophy of making 3D printers that don't require tinkering and can be simply used as a tool. So as you watch this, please consider two questions. Are any of the products in this video of interest to you? And are Bamboo Lab printers even worth modifying at all? Let's jump in by looking at some example products. Despite their relationship perhaps being a little bit strained recently, Big Tree Tech seem quite dedicated to making aftermarket parts for Bamboo Lab printers with their Panda range. As we can see from the website, for each printer there's a range of parts. Some of them offer versatility like a different build plate, whereas others, like the ones we'll be testing today, allow customization and the addition of accessories. Now when making this video, I found it a bit frustrating because although there was lots of resources, they were spread across various websites. So what I've linked below are the product pages on the BQ website. You'll find a good overview by coming to these. I've also linked the Big Tree Tech GitHub because there's files that you need to print as well as user manuals there. I've also linked the Big Tree Tech Wiki, as in some cases that has by far the most detailed information. And then finally, I've linked the Maker World profile for Big Tree Tech where there's duplicates of some of the print files posted, but more importantly, there might be user remixes that you'd prefer, so it's worth checking out this too. Each of these items was supplied free of charge by Big Tree Tech to be tested in accordance with my review policy, which means honest and transparent. I was also greatly assisted by Australian company 3D Bro, which I will explain later on. The first product we're going to test out is called the Panda Jetpack, and it's to suit the P1 and X1 series. As you can see, the price is 32 US dollars and this is a straight part cooling upgrade or so it's claimed. For either of these printers, it's a straight fit, magnetically snapping to the front of the print head like the factory part, but the ducts on the underside are different. Of the parts you'll see in this video, this one is by far the simplest to install and get going. Inside the box, you'll find a little leaflet with a QR code through to the wiki. You'll find a set of Panda theme stickers, and of course, the actual cover and part cooling ducts. This has a skeleton design aimed at weight saving. And the final thing you'll find in the box are two hex keys required for the installation. The material for this part is nylon, 3D printed with MJF. This is typically light, tough and stronger because it's a little bit flexible, meaning it won't break if you drop it. Let's compare the jetpack with the standard cover for the Bamboo Lab X1 Carbon. And as you can see, the overall dimensions are the same, but we have BQ branding instead of Bamboo Lab on the front. However, the top piece of branding you can see is 3D printed. So, as the website suggests, you can pop out this segment to have your own custom logo. Beyond part cooling, one of the advantages here is meant to be a weight saving. With the standard X1 carbon cover coming in at 26 grams, and the Big Tree Tech jetpack coming in 6 grams lighter at 20 grams but the primary interest should be the ducts as that's the main change between the two. The standard part blows from the left and right hand side, whereas the jetpack blows from four corners diagonally. Installation is very straightforward. We simply pull off the magnetic cover from the printer and then unplug the connector on the inside to separate it from the machine. There's two screws that need to be undone to remove the factory blower fan. And there's also two screws for the little PCB at the top that interfaces with the fan and provides the backlighting for the logo. Once all of these fasteners are removed, the fan and PCB should just slide up and away. To finish off, we follow these same steps but in reverse, sliding in the fan and then securing it as well as the PCB using the factory screws. This design gives a prominent view of the blower fan. And to finish off, we plug back in that connector going to the print head and offering the new cover from a lower position to clear the hot end. We position the jetpack and then push it forward to let the magnets do their thing and hold it in position. We can see up the top how the BQ branded panel looks with the LED lighting turned on and off. There's no additional calibration or setup related to the 3D printer's firmware listed in the instructions. As you would hope, before installing the jetpack, I conducted a series of test prints as a baseline. Since a claimed benefit is the lighter weight for the print head when using the jetpack, I printed this acceleration test which is designed to show ringing. This is normally used as part of a free test on my calibration website. But for this test, I just downloaded the SDL and sliced it normally with Orca Slicer. 
There is a side by side and as you can see there's pretty much no ringing in either case. And that's because this printer has the Bamboo Lab equivalent of Clipper's input shaping. So while it's true the jetpack is only 77% of the weight of the standard item, the resonance tests conducted before each print automatically adjust for the different mass so the end result ends up being the same. Now to test those ducks with my part cooling torture test. And this is quite a challenging print. There's four sections that get steeper as they go up and if there's any loose plastic that isn't cooled properly, there's a fair chance the nozzle will hit it and snap that section off as we saw with this before print. Even like this, there's still plenty of good information for a comparison. The reprint with the jetpack in place ended up pretty much the same way, which doesn't inspire confidence that this is an upgrade. Even so, let's take a look side by side. In this comparison, I think there's very little difference between the two. We have the section underneath with the bridges, I think they look identical, and then the underside of each of the half arches. And again, I can't tell if there's any improvement here, I think they're pretty much the same, as are the central spires. Another cooling test, this Torture Spider by Critical Print 3D, and for this one I decided to print it at 200% scale. When we look at the side by side, on this one that's perhaps a marginal improvement for the jetpack version. If we look at the leg pointing vertically up, the overhangs are a little bit cleaner in this section. But when we compare the legs on the other side, I think they're pretty much the same. So it's hard to say this is a definitive improvement. The same goes for the overhangs on the abdomen. I'd say they look pretty much identical. So what I think is happening here is that the ducts are different and maybe on paper that's an improvement. But ultimately, there's still only one blower fan powering the part cooling. So performance improvements will be minimal at best. You can make your own judgment, but these are my before and after results. On to item two. Next up, we have the Big Tree Tech Panda Branch, and this one comes in at 26 US dollars. This device is a way to add more USB sockets to power other accessories like RGB LEDs or webcams, and it's compatible with the XP and A series range of 3D printers. Inside the box, we have the actual Panda Branch. It's got an input as well as four outputs to match the Bamboo Lab AMS, and then a four hub USB output as well. We have a cable to connect it to the printer that matches the plug for that AMS. We have some mounting hardware. And finally, we have our information card with a QR code to the wiki, as well as the usual Big Tree Tech yellow rubber ducky. On the Panda Branch GitHub, we can find the print files to mount the branch on our printer. We have an STL folder with subfolders for A1, A1 mini, X1 carbon, and P1P. And the files for each printer will always have these same two parts and then additional parts to suit that printer. All of the parts are single color, so again, it's worth checking the remixes like this one from Fun Dips found on Maker World. The two shared pieces form an enclosure with an upper and lower piece, with the Panda Branch sitting right in the middle and the two halves held together by two of the self-tapping screws included in the box. This is a nice snug fit with great access for each of the input output ports, as well as the dip switches on the back but the OK LED as well as the fault LED are covered with this printed case. This enclosure is perhaps a little bit too snug in places. For instance, there's no cutout for the tab on the plug to flex and be removed. So you'll probably have to loosen the top screws to spread the enclosure apart and remove some cables. On the lower piece, we'll find four bores to use with the additional parts to mount to each printer. For X1 and P1, the third piece goes underneath the factory spool holder on the back of the machine. We'll remove the bracket introduce the printed part, put the spool holder back on top, and then use the included longer M3 bolts to clamp everything back down securely. We then attach the branch enclosure to the side of this using the two remaining self-tapping screws. For these two printers, I think this location works quite well. It's a good blend between discrete and still being accessible. Unfortunately, things aren't quite so smooth when it comes to the A1 and A1 Mini. We have this additional bracket which flexes around one of the vertical posts and twists to face backwards. The self-tapping screws then go into the enclosure from either side to hold it in place, but you might have noticed it's not exactly secure. It seems intuitive to print a second brace to hold the top, but as you can see here, that would block the motion of the gantry, so therefore it can only be attached at the very bottom. I guess as an alternative, you can mount it up the top, but I'm sure the vibrations from using the machine would have it slide down mid-print. On the A1 Mini, we have a similar bracket which flexes around the vertical post, and then the enclosure is secured to it using those same self-tapping screws. I think in this position, it looks a little awkward and there's also nothing to stop it from vibrating and rattling mid-print. So I would suggest in either case, some adhesive-backed foam might be a nice addition to prevent this. 
powering the branch is as simple as connecting the included cable from the printer to the input port. And that's it, turn on the printer and the installation is complete. So if you are wanting more USB outlets to power things like LEDs in an enclosure, or perhaps an IP webcam so you can monitor the printer without the Bamboo Lab Cloud, or perhaps something more obscure, like charging batteries for a camera directly from the 3D printer, well, this product will allow it. As for these four output ports, if you are running an AMS or AMS Lite, it can be connected to one of these outputs when the printer is turned off. And I was able to verify it works exactly as before through this interface. The other thing to connect here is a pandanomi, which we'll cover in the next section. The other thing we have are these dip switches to limit the current to the USB ports. And amazingly, the reason for this is not explained anywhere in the wiki or manual. We have to go digging in the documents for the pandanomi to understand what it's for. Let's say we plug in a pandanomi and it consumes 0.65 watts. The nomi instructions tell us that that will safely leave 2 amps for the ports. So the dip switches in that case would be set to allow a limit of 2 amps to be available to the USB ports and avoid an overload condition. However, it's not explained whether any dip switch changes are required if you're plugging in an AMS or AMS light. So I'd say works as advertised, but potentially not for everyone. On to item three, the Panda Nomi. Our last product is the Panda Nomi, and this one starts from US $36. This is a Bamboo Lab specific version of the Nomi previously released to suit Voron and other custom printers. This uses non-critical communication with the printer and that means it's not affected by Bamboo Lab security firmware update. However, that also means that it's limited to one-way communication from the printer by using graphics to display the current status, and consequently that means you cannot input or control the printer from any way from this screen. And technically, this one is compatible with all of the existing Bamboo Lab range. However, if you have an X1 Carbon, you already have a full-color touchscreen, so it's much better suited to the P-Series, assuming you're not already running a Panda Touch. But really, I think this is aimed at A1 and A1 Mini, as suggested by all of the images used in the marketing. Included in the box for the Panda Nomi is a plastic case with the actual screen inside. This is protected in an anti-static bag, and we can see that on the rear of the display, we have two ports for powering it and a Wi-Fi module. There should also be a cable to power the Nomi with an AMS style plug, some cable ties to assist with cable management, the usual yellow rubber ducky, and an information card with a QR code to lead you to the wiki. And the wiki is by far the most detailed document available going through installation on a range of printers as well as setup and customization. You'll find a print file section on the GitHub categorized by the type of printer. And in each of those folders, you'll find 3MF and SDL versions of the various designs. So let's cover these with a brief overview. For the P1 series, we have this gauge style holder that clips into the hole already present in the top of the machine. This one prints on a 45 degree angle with support to make sure the flexible sections remain strong enough. Once this enclosure is snapped into position, the Nomi display is meant to angle in, but I found this very tight and I stopped here as I didn't want to break anything. For the A1 series, if you buy it as an option from the shop, you can get a clear case that goes on the print head. This comes with a detailed hard copy of the installation instructions, and of course the actual enclosure, which is a two part design. The Nomi sits in between the two parts of the enclosure and then replaces the factory cover as well as the extruder wheel to be in full display on the front of the printhead. Installing like this will add approximately 10 grams of weight, so a printable enclosure is available to mount the Nomi on the right hand side of the gantry for the A1 and the only part of the gantry available on the A1 Mini. Wherever you're installing, you'll need to feed the power cable or a USB-C cable into position before installing the enclosure. To help hold the power cable out of the way, we have a printed bracket that goes on top of the print head. This keeps it clear of the filament cutter, as well as another printed part if you're using an AMS light, to secure the new power cable at its highest point. Beyond that, it's just cable ties to keep the remaining wires out of the way and tidy, before plugging in the other end of the power cable to an empty AMS slot or the Panda branch. The screen looks perfect, but when I powered it up, it was obvious that something had gone very wrong. The front face was actually cracked and the screen no longer usable. Reviewing my footage, I'm pretty sure the crack was already in it, but it's hard to know for sure. Fortunately, I found a shop in 3D Bro that was about an hour away, had a Panda Nomi in stock, and even had the option for me to go and collect it immediately. So thank you very much to 3D Bro for assisting me in getting this video done on time. Cautiously, I peeled off the protective film from the new version, 
took extra care when loading it into the enclosure and was relieved to find that when I powered the printer on, it was working as it should be without any damage. As you can see, scanning the QR code will help connect you to a network which will allow you to connect the Nomi to the same Wi-Fi network as your printer. The instructions found on the wiki for this phase are very thorough. Once bound to the printer, the Nomi will display the idle animation and let me tell you there is a lot of winking. I haven't seen this much winking since George Costanza got grapefruit juice in his eye. As mentioned, the Nomi will display an animation depending on the printer status and we see here the animation for homing. The animation for when the nozzle is heating, which actually has the temperature values, and if the printer experiences an error, a QR code to get help is displayed for a few seconds at least before the blinking restarts, but I have to say the yellow background didn't give enough contrast for my phone to be able to scan it. If we start a print, we can see more of the animations, like this one for purging the nozzle, real-time temperatures as the bed is heated, vibration compensation tuning is undertaken, the nozzle is wiped and cleaned, auto bed leveling is taking place, and the filament is being extruded for flow calibration. Finally, during the actual print, we get a real-time percentage of the print progress. At any time, we can use a phone or computer to reconnect to the Nomi's Wi-Fi network and receive the interface for changing the Wi-Fi details, customizing and updating firmware. On the Nomi GitHub repo, you'll find all of the factory animations which you can download and copy the format of if you're making your own in Photoshop or similar. There's also some alternate GIFs that you can use instead, and collections of animations stored as IMG files, including the factory ones as a backup, and more interesting sets like this Rick and Morty theme. Overall, the interface does work, but I found it a bit buggy. For instance, the preview GIF function would not work for me at all, but I was still able to update successfully to the Rick and Morty theme, which introduces completely new animations for the idle state, nozzle and bed heating, although the legibility is not great here, there's a very entertaining animation for the homing sequence, likewise for the nozzle cleaning sequence, the auto bed leveling sequence, nozzle flow calculation, and so on. My only disappointment with this great theme was that the print progress indicator was still the same as before. So it's hard to argue against the Nomi being purely cosmetic, but it should become more appealing as Big Tree Tech and the community make more and more themes. But is that enough? I ask again. Are any of the products you've seen in this video actually appealing to you? And are Bamboo Lab printers worth modifying at all? I have some more upgrade parts to test in the future, but they're instead focused on performance and functionality, so it will be interesting to see how they're received by comparison. Thank you so much for watching, get your responses down below in the comments, and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.